Carl, thanks for joining us. You spoke to students here at Letourneau uh, just a, a few minutes ago, and you, you acknowledged that the American politics are broken, but you went on to say that this is not the first time we've been in this place. Give us some color on that. Well, look, we've had, uh, Washington doesn't seem to work periodically. I mean, it, it uh, goes back to the lead up to the 1800 presidential election. Washington, D.C. didn't seem to be working, which is why the Federalists lost power and the Democratic Republicans under Thomas Jefferson emerged. We had a terrible period after the 1824 election in which Andrew Jackson believed the election had been literally stolen from him by a bargain between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. And uh, we see it in the election of 1828 that this gets resolved by the election of, of Jackson and the emergence of the modern Democratic Party. Politics is clearly broken during the decade of the 1850s. And on comes the threat of civil war and secession. And the, uh, the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 changes American politics. Gilded Age. The, the disruption caused in the economy by the Great Depression, uh, the, the counter-reaction to Lyndon Johnson's Great Society and urban unrest and campus unrest in the Vietnam War and the impeachment of Richard Nixon. And now we're in another period of populism where uh, lots of people on the left and right believe that their government is broken, uh, that the relationship between the government and them as ordinary citizens is somehow all messed up and that uh, some people are getting ahead who don't deserve to get ahead. And the definition of who those people are differs be between whether you're on the right or you're on the left. And as a result, the parties are, 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 are bollocked up and things don't get done and people get fed up with it and at some point it'll get made right. I covered both conventions <clears throat> in 2016, the, the Democrats and the Republicans. And what was astonishing to me was how much of the same rhetoric I heard at both conventions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Trump was, is, a, is not the normal Republican presidential candidate. He's a protectionist. Uh, he's an anti-interventionist. He, he, look, this was a guy who not, did not spend his lifetime, uh, his adult lifetime, uh, working in the Republican vineyards. He supported John Kerry for president in the 2004. He thought about running for president himself in 2000 as the candidate of the Reform Party. His biggest contrib political contributions prior to running for president were to elect Nancy Pelosi Speaker of the House in 2006. He's a guy who in 2007 said he thought she was doing a, a great job, except she hadn't done enough to impeach George W. Bush. So his rhetoric is not that of a typical Republican candidate. On the other hand, you saw in the Democratic convention, the Bernie Sanders delegates, who were a significant minority in that convention, about 45, 46 percent of the delegates, they were not the normal Democrats. They you might have believed they were the majority at some of the time. Yeah, but they, they screamed a lot louder. <coughs> yeah, they did. Yeah. How has Donald Trump structurally changed, if he has, the GOP? Well, we don't know, because it's hard in two years to, to, to be definitive about it. We did, we did see in both the 26th presidential election and in the 2018 midterm elections defections of traditionally Republican voters in the suburbs, white, college-educated, particularly women. Uh, on the other hand, that was offset to some degree in 2016, but not 2018, by defection of blue-collar Democrats. Um, they were drawn to Trump in 2016. They didn't partic particularly vote in the, Republican, uh, uh, in the Republican column in 2018. I suspect they'll return for him in 2020. But I think we're very much, I think Trump is a transitional figure. I think he, it, figures who are not transitional who fundamentally alter American politics, do so in their first term. Thomas Jefferson does so in the first term of his presidency. Jackson does in his first term. Uh, Lincoln does. Um, FDR does in his first term. Um, Ronald Reagan does in his first term. And we see it reflected in their reelections. So I think we're, we're more likely to be, whether he wins or loses, we're likely to see Trump as a transitional figure as both parties try and figure out where they are. On the subject of both parties with respect to the Democrats, you know, the, the field that's now announced is far, far, far to the left of Bill Clinton sure. back in the 90s. Uh, is that far left electable today? Well, I think, I think it, they, you, run, you run the likelihood of the Democrats having a tougher road if they go with somebody on the far left. Because, look, how did, how did Barack Obama win in 2012? He, he promised that we was going to bring us together. It's not a... Well, that, that was 2000. A, yeah, well, yeah, that sure was 2008. That's 2012. Right, right. Dude, remember, President Trump's reelect today is 38. At this point, Barack Obama's was 43. And what did we see? We saw a little bit of new policy. We saw some rhetorical bows towards unity. 
But Barack Obama spent most of his 2012 election campaign disqualifying Mitt Romney in the eyes of the American voter. And my sense is that the Trump people recognize they've got to have some new policy, and it's got to be aimed at those white college-educated suburbanites. I don't think it was an accident. They talked about paid family leave in his in his uh, uh, State of the Union address. And he's got to have uh, some uh, rhetorical bows towards unity again. I thought that was the most powerful part of his State of the Union address is when he said we need to have prosperity for all, we're all in this together. But he's going to spend a lot of time disqualifying the ultimate Democratic nominee. Quickly, because since you brought it up, the State of the Union, most of them I find forgettable. This one I think I'm going to remember. How do you grade it? Well, it, fr from a structure of a speech, it was, it was odd because it sort of zoomed from here to there and back again. He's, look, he's, his best is not to give a set piece speech, but he, he hit the right notes. It's just, you know, a no, note of unity. He hit a note about, uh, you know, the Democratic Party was standing for socialism. And we're not going to stand for that. He hit a note of new policy with things like family leave. I thought it was particularly powerful when he talked about immigration and related. You can tell when this guy is sort of personally glued into something. And when he talked about those angel families, uh, you know, families that had lost a loved one to violence by an illegal alien, you knew that he felt passionately about that. You could just tell the emotion was there. And then the moment that he had with a great moment, uh, apropos of really nothing much, but it was a great moment, and that is when he had the survivor of Dachau and then the liberator of Dachau. Right. as a reminder of American greatness. So I, I thought it hit all those notes. It, it wasn't particularly well structured, but we all, we're gonna, all going to walk away from a speech like that and sort of remember the high points, and he had some good high points. The cable TV networks most particularly were uh, sharply critical of the, of the Republican leadership in the House. Most notably, Lou Dobbs was simply withering in his criticism of Paul Ryan as Speaker yeah. of the House. To what de degree do you accept that criticism, and would you say that, that Ryan's tepid support of Trump played a factor in costing the GOP the House? I, I, I don't agree with Mr. Dobbs. Okay. So let's take, for example, the wall, which Mr. Dobbs blames uh, Paul Ryan for not getting him the wall. Well, President Trump comes in, and his chief immigration advisor, Stephen Miller, is focused on the ban on Muslim countries which immediately gets turned o overturned in Congress and they have to rewrite it. 2017 passes without the new president ever asking for a supplemental appropriation to build the wall. In 2018, for the FY 2018 budget, they ask for about $1.6 billion, they get one point, or excuse me, they ask for $1.4 billion, they get $1.2 billion. For FY 19, they ask for uh, one point, or for 1.8 and get 1.4. Now, if this was the big deal, then the president should have said in 2017, Speaker Ryan, Leader, <coughs> Leader McConnell, I need your support. I want to get the wall built. Here's my supplemental appropriation. So for Lou Dobbs now to say, well, it's Paul Ryan's fault, the president has to make the ask and set the tone. And he did not ask for a supplemental appropriation in 2017, did not ask for $5.7 billion in his 2018 budget, didn't even ask for it in his original FY 2019 budget only ask for it when they got stymied this fall. So, uh, but, you know, look, I respect Lou Dobbs, but he's wrong on this one. Just a, a little while ago, speaking to the students here at Letourneau, you were sharply critical of the House Freedom Caucus, of one of the members yeah. of which is uh, the congressman that represents the first district here of mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. Explain your, an your antipathy toward the, the Freedom Caucus. I, I think the Freedom Caucus has been inconsistent. They voted, for example, for Tom Price's bill to repeal and replace Obamacare several times and then turned around and, and, and attacked the same bill and said they wouldn't vote for it the, a third time because it, it allowed premiums to rise for people on the Affordable Care Act. Well, the only reason it allowed premiums to rise on the Affordable Care Act is it, is it phased out the Affordable Care Act over a two-year period. So they voted for it twice, and then suddenly they found themselves for reasons that are just beyond me, attacking the bill that they had already voted for and saying they're not going to vote for it unless changes are made. And we saw this on the tax reform bill. Freedom Caucus members who were part of the Ways and Means Committee. The Freedom Caucus says its number one goal is to conduct business in regular order, which means things move through the committee structure and onto the floor. <coughs> well, the, the tax reform measure, chaired Ways and Means, chaired by a Texan, 
uh, Kevin Brady from the Woodlands, moved through in regular order. There were Freedom Caucus members on the committee who played a role in, in fashioning the bill and voted for it. And then when it gets ready to come to the floor, the Freedom Caucus members say, wait a minute, we're 20 some odd members of the caucus. And unless you write, rewrite the bill to meet our specifications, we're going to vote with the Democrats and kill it. Well, you know what? Politics is a team sport. And if you want regular order, then stand for regular order. They did the same thing when it came to uh, the budget resolution. There were Freedom Caucus members on the Budget Resolutions Committee. It comes through the regular process. They discuss it in the Republican conference. Plenty of time to make, the, make their views known and people through whom they could make them. Comes out of the, the, res, the uh, Budget Committee on a unanimous vote. And then they say, well, unless you rewrite it to meet our, our needs and our desires, we're not going to vote for it. Well, you start making that a habit and suddenly everybody gets to be part of their little group that makes that same kind of set of demands and all order breaks down. Look, I'm a strong conservative. I don't need anybody to lecture me on being a conservative. And yet that's exactly what the Freedom Caucus members did by taking positions that are at, at odds with the positions they took in the past. If that bill by Tom Price was so bad, why did you vote for it twice before and then suddenly say, oh, we've now discovered that it allows the Affordable Care Act to continue for the next two years, so there are going to be premium increases, and we're going to call those a tax. No, that's not a tax. It's a premium increase by people who elected to participate in the Affordable Care Act. So your choice is either let them go forward for two years and pay those premium increases or cut it off immediately. And there was no stomach at all, even among the Freedom Caucus members, for cutting off the Affordable Care Act overnight. The Democrats seem to do a good job of maintaining party discipline and keeping, the, keeping all the horses pulling the wagon in the same direction. The Republicans can't seem to. How does that get fixed? Well, it, it gets fixed because <clears throat> they're now in the majority and they're going to find out they have their equivalent of the Freedom Caucus in the Democratic Socialist left wing of the Democratic Party. You think people like uh, Ocasio, uh, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez Cortez, yeah. and, and uh, uh, Oman and Tillabar and these other left-wingers are going to go along with the centrist Democrats who represent districts that were carried by Donald Trump. There's a, there's a day of reckoning coming inside that party, and they're going to have just as many difficulties as the Republicans have had because their left wing is the equivalent of the Freedom Caucus. Republicans face a structural deficit in the fact that the media, academe, Hollywood, the culture, uh, all those voices of the, of, the, of the culture are lined up against Republicans. Yeah, yeah. How the, does that ever get fixed, or is that just a permanent part of being a Republican? Well, I think that's mostly a permanent part of being a Republican because they've, they've aimed to control those. Uh, we used to be, ironically enough, back in the Gilded Age in the early part of the 20th century in control of academia, which was dominated by, by Republican, great Republicans at the head of our great universities, but no longer. Look, the good news for us is, is that the majority of the American people are center-right. The obligation to fight against all of those, the media, academia, Hollywood, and the culture, is for us to make a persuasive case. For example, I think it's really important, really, really important that all this stuff that is coming out from the left wing, that we not just mock it and laugh at it and you know discard it, but that we take it seriously and make a principled case to the American people. First of all, why it's bad, why it's not in keeping with our values, how it will wreck important parts of our country, and then we need to, to lay out a Republican alternative. So when we say Medicare for all, is a big mistake. We can't afford it. It's basically going to take Medicare, which a lot of seniors depend on, and bankrupt it even earlier. It's going to result in people having to have long delays for, for treatments and for uh, examinations. Let's make all those arguments, but then let's also match them with Republicans want to make health insurance more affordable and accessible to all Americans. And in order to do that, we need to increase health savings accounts. We need to focus on competition and consumer choice. We need to, we, people need to be able to know what a hospital is going to cost them for an operation when they go in. We need all kinds of reforms that are market-oriented, free enterprise solutions that put the individual in charge, not the government. In early 2007, I wrote a piece and I told a story about how in a group of my friends in junior high school, we badly mistreated this poor, sweet, old, old lady a teacher of Texas history and how you know, I, as I grew up and matured I realized that I shouldn't have done that and I was remorseful for it and I, I tied that to will the media ever be remorseful for the way they treated George W. Bush after 2006? Well I'll tell you this I can't tell you how many people have come up and told me in the media and Democrats and said God Bush really looks great in retrospect doesn't he? I mean our politics is so broken today they get it but look I was a hothead 
So I'd read the New York Times editorial in 2006 or seven, and sort of, you know, say, you know, tell the, the president would say early in the morning, what, what's in the papers today? <coughs> oh, he already knew. And, but I'd flame on about some New York Times or Washington Post editorial, and he'd laugh at it and say, history will get it right and we'll both be dead. And that's a healthy attitude to have. Well, let me, but let me, let me take issue with yeah. that, because those of us who were out here in the field trying to support the president, and we felt like he wasn't given, he wasn't back in our play, wasn't supporting it, wasn't fighting back. He was, and if you had it to do over again, would you have fought back more against what they did in 2006, seven, and in Well, we, we fought back, but again, you know, his choice was lead the country in a time of war or worry about the latest little story taking a whack at him. And he, he chose to keep a focus on making sure that the consensus remained there for support for the war. And there's a limited amount of time you can have in, in, as a president to, to defend what you're doing and to explain to the American people what you're doing. And he felt it was more important to keep a consensus in the country. And remember, Obama comes in having been a war opponent and feels obligated to keep U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, he then ultimately made a decision to withdraw every, every bit of America, virtually all American troops from Iraq, all of our air assets and, and war fighting capabilities, and look what happened there. But Bush decided, I want to make certain that with this mission that we're on, we, we, we have a, a, a consensus to do so, and that's where I'm going to put my time and energy and effort. Last question, because I know you have to go. 2000, there's an awful lot going right in the country at the oh, moment. Yeah, the, the, economy, the economy is, is roaring. It's best it's been in a very long time. Manufacturing jobs are returning. I think with the... the, the unemployment rates. Unemployment rates at, 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 at a decades-long yeah. minimum. You, yeah. we, could, we could go down the yeah. list. That would seem like a walk for a sitting president. Well, it would be if the president focused on that. Uh, but he hasn't. We, we've learned about his attitudes towards uh, Saturday Night Live and Meryl Streep's acting ability. He's been way too uh, consumed in his Twitter feed, in my opinion, on the Mueller investigation. I think the Mueller investigation is going to find no evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign. And, but he spent a lot of time talking about that. And again, there's a limited amount of time that even a president with an active Twitter account there's a limited number of items he can talk about and a limited amount of time he can grab of our attention. I wish he was talking more about the economy and why it's happening and, more importantly, what are the next steps. He can't simply run for re-election by saying, look what I've done for you in 2017, 2018, and 2019. He's got to say, and here's the next chapter of what we want to try and achieve for the country. I said it was the last question, but it wasn't because you made me think of one. Um, the last question is, with respect to the Mueller investigations, it ties to the FBI, the DOJ, and all of the, all of the things yeah. that we now know that were going on. Right. Does that ever get set right? Is there ever a reckoning for what we could clearly see with some serious malfeasance? Well, there, yeah, Comey was fired, and he should have been fired. What he did on the Hillary Clinton investigation, he has no authority to make the decision not to, not to charge her. That, that decision, since the history of our country, what began, we have separated the police power from the decision to prosecute. And he crossed that line. He was in charge of investigating that. It was the Justice Department that, that should have made that decision. He unilaterally took it upon himself. And then he did what we shouldn't have any prosecutor in this country do. And that is, he said, I'm not going to prosecute Hillary Clinton, but let me tell you how bad she is. I mean, we don't want that president, Republican or Democrat, we don't want that president to be around. And then he reopened the investigation in the fall because Anthony Weiner, I mean, this is intruding into the election. He should not have. He should have been fired. And I'm glad President Trump fired him. And he, it, you know, there seems to be a culture at the top of the FBI under Comey of like-minded individuals like Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and McCabe, all of whom were doing things that were highly partisan and inappropriate and were doing so because... The tone was being set by Jim Comey. Were they indictable, though? Are they indictable offenses? I don't think so. I'm, I, am a, I am worried about the, and I hope the FISA judges, the people who oversee uh, 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 national security wiretaps, examine the fact that McCabe apparently went to them with information that was from the, uh, from the, Steele, the, dossier. the Steele dossier, which was bought and paid for by the Hillary C Clinton campaign and the DNC by hiding the money that was being used to pay for it. Was that a campaign violation? And, and more importantly, from the FISA judge's perspective, were they told everything that they felt they deserved to be told about the source of the information on which they issued the, the, uh, the wiretap on Carter Page? Now, let's not turn Carter Page into a hero. This is a guy whom the Russians actively tried to recruit several years before as an active agent on their behalf inside the United States and decided that they weren't going to do so because they thought he was a moron. And he should never have been in the Trump campaign, should not have been within 100 miles. Somebody ill-served President Trump by taking this guy who had no foreign, uh, foreign 
uh, Ferris credentials and was clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, an advocate of and a devotee of, of Putin, so much so that the Russians tried to recruit him as an, as an espionage agent, he should have been within 100 miles of the Trump campaign. So many people uh, were, were involved in the Trump campaign who shouldn't have been there, and, 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 and Rick Gates, Paul Manafort, we know about them, but there are others like Carter Page as well. I think we have to leave it there. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.